guys know, but we're, what we're doing is uh, in September we went through Psalm 90 to 96, and what we're doing now is we're circling back and we're unpacking all of those Psalms, the themes of those Psalms. And what I want us to understand is that they, they're telling a story. As we move into the kingdom of God, we need to understand that uh, what's going on is there's real discipleship for us here in the theme of Psalm 90 to 96. And so we looked at the first sermon series we did was on humility and how when we enter in the kingdom of God, God wants us to be, to, humble, to be humble and recognize he's the one that does the work. And after that, we moved into Psalm 91 about setting up spiritual disciplines in our life and, and, and knowing how to dwell well with God. And, and once those things happen, we don't leave them behind, but then we start to see that God, what he wants to do is give us spiritual perceptivity to recognize the rhythms of grace. That he is present in our life and as we do spiritual disciplines, and as we do other things, we start to recognize how, uh, we, we talked about this in Psalm 92, how there's, this, there's this, these, these ups and downs, these ebbs and flows in life, and to be able to recognize God in the midst of those. So we're looking at, we're going to do, what we're going to do is we're going to do a sermon series on the Sabbath, and it's called Biblical Theology, where we take one idea and we go all the way from Genesis all the way tell Hebrews or maybe even Revelation and unpack that and, and put together an idea, a picture of what the Sabbath means and how it, the idea develops over Scripture. And so uh, what, I have this picture here of a, a cedar tree. Uh, these are cedars of Lebanon. And Solomon, when he built the temple, he used them because they're big and strong. And at the end of Psalm 92, it talks about, it talks about this strength and this flourishing and this victory and this longevity about being in the presence of God. And we get it from these rhythms and these ebbs and flows where we recognize the grace of God and he just keeps washing over us and washing over us with these rhythms that change us. So what I want to do is uh, this week I want to look at this missing puzzle piece in a lot of our lives. It's called the Sabbath. I want to talk about how it's intrinsic. It's been built into what it means to be a human being. I want to show you something really crazy here in Genesis chapter one. So I wanna start, I'm gonna start by summarizing Genesis one, verses one to 25, and then we'll jump into our passage, okay? So if you remember, how does, how does Genesis one start? Do you guys know? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and it says now the earth was formless and void, or formless and empty. I think we've talked about this before, but the, the earth is formless. It doesn't have structure, and it's empty. There's nothing inside of it. So what I'm going to quickly explain is that Genesis 1, the first day, what God is doing is he's separating light from darkness. And in the second day, he separates water from sky. And in the third day, he separates water from land. Okay, so that, that's forming. He's, he's, he's creating forms and structures. And then the second thing he does is day four, five, and six correspond with the first three days. So he separated light from darkness, and then he puts the sun and the moon, and he creates structures and orders and patterns and rhythms and seasons. And then the second day down corresponds with the other one. He, he, the water was separated from the sky, so he puts birds, and he puts fish in the water. Do you see that? And the last one, the water's taken care of already, so now he puts animals and humans and plants on the land. Do you see that? So God is forming, and then he's filling. Out of chaos, he's bringing structure and order and beauty. Right? So, so we see that God loves order and structure and beauty and rhythms, and he loves the beauty that flows out of them. Do you guys see that? And, and so what does God say at the end of every day? It is good. So you kind of get this picture that God is enjoying this process, no? Like God, that God's, as he's doing this, he's really enjoying what he's doing. His work is enjoyable to him. So what I want to start, right in verse 26, it says, Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea. And, and so the first thing I want to say is, based on the verses we've already kind of summarized, what do we know about God? If, we, if we're made in his image, and if we have something, that's, something to do with his likeness, what do we see about God? 
Well, God seems to like order, and he seems to like the beauty that comes from that, but he also takes joy in working and creating. Do you guys see that? And somehow that corresponds to who we are as human beings. Right? So, some, something, so, so what it means to be in the image of God, to, to be in his likeness, something is in there. Now, what I want to just, I want to, what do we want to do is verse 26 is kind of like God's proposal. God's saying, this is what I want to do. And then verses 27, 28, 29, and 30 is him doing it. Okay, so let's just, I'll have the stuff up here. I'm kind of summarizing as we go. So, so God, on verse 27, he says, okay, this is what I want to do. And he actually does it. He creates us in his image, in his likeness, male and female. And then it says that God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth and subdue it. So when we look at those two words, dominion and subdue, what, how, how do you guys interpret those words? What do those words mean? Yeah. So I think some people, when we, we see subdue and rule, uh, that means to like, to be overcharged and to, to like have like power over top of. And those words in Hebrew, they do mean that. The, you, those words are later used in the Bible of kings that they come and they subdue or they conquer something. But I don't know if exactly it's saying that we should exploit the earth. The reason why I don't think that is because, do you see how it says fill the earth and subdue it? And earlier in Genesis, what did it say? It said that God creates forms and then he fills them. And if we're in the image of God, there's, there's something about the, what we do which is similar to the way God works, right? So, so God looks at this world and it says that the world is empty, it's formless and it's void, and God takes it and he subdues it. He, cre- he takes it and he creates and forms and he creates beauty and structures and rhythms. Do you see that? This is how God subdues the earth, is he takes it and creatively builds it into something beautiful. And so we are to fill the earth and also... Come on, be honest. Yeah, it depends on the work. So I'm, I'm an electrician, or I was an electrician, and I know what it's like in July to climb through. I think it's my battery. Okay. So, so I know what it's like to crawl around in an attic in July and you're just dripping sweat and there's the, the blown insulation and the, the insulation's this deep and you're trying to get to the soffits and you're like, oh, and you're swimming in insulation. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Is that one is that one good? I think that's on there. Okay. Going old school here. But I, I think that sometimes we think that work is actually something that's a curse. And I sometimes feel that. I feel like, man, if Adam and Eve wouldn't have screwed up, then all of us wouldn't have to work. We would just be sitting in the Garden of Eden and we'd have lawn chairs and be eating grapes and go swimming. It'd be like all-inclusive. And they screwed it up for the rest of us, right? And so I, even some of us, when we were taught in church, we were taught that after the fall, then the work started. And so I want to read something here. This is in Genesis three seventeen. God curses the, the, uh, the, the snake, he curses the woman, and he creates, curses the man. I want to read what it says. It says, Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat of it all the days of your life, and it will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. 
and by the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. And I think a lot of us think that, that, that this is the, the, like the last statement or this is the definitive word on what work is. That because we screwed up now, we have to work hard and it sucks. But I want us to understand that what, it, what God is saying to Adam is, now when you have to work the ground, which you were meant to do, now it's gonna fight back. Now it's not gonna, sub, it won't let you subdue it and rule it. It's gonna be a lot of pain. And it, you're not gonna get a lot of bang for your buck when you work. That's what he's saying. And the reason we know this is because in Genesis 2, what does it say? It says, the Lord God took the man and he put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to care for it. Do you see that? that that's, that's before we fell, that there's something intrinsic. We were meant to work. And we were meant to enjoy work, but something happened after the fall. Okay? But I really want us to understand that work is a good thing. Work's a good thing. And so let's, let's just go back to our verses here. God is kind of in, in 28 and 29 and 30, God is kind of explaining how we will subdue the earth and he gives us these plants and he gives us these seeds and he's saying creatively have dominion, control this and build it into something even more beautiful. Imitate me the way I took forms and structures and beauty and you do that too. And so God's kind of talking about giving us responsibility so that we would cultivate and we'd have direction over this world, we'd have dominion over it in a good way. Now, in, in verse 31, what does God say? God saw all that he had made and it was very good, right? It was very good. So who's done all the work up to this point in our story? God. Do you guys get the impression, this, other, ways, other times he said it was very, it's good, but now he says it's very good. Do you get the impression that God's really enjoying this? That God maybe has a smile on his face and this isn't a big burden for him. Okay. Let's just go to this, this section here. We're going to start looking at Sabbath now. But this is all going to make sense as we go further in our message here. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. And by the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and he made it holy because on it he rested from all his work of creating that he had done. Okay, so in these verses, we, we, it, earlier it says that we are made in the likeness and the image of God. In these verses, what do we see about being in the image of God? When we look at these verses here about God, what do we see about ourselves if we're in his likeness? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah. Brent, you're stealing my thunder, man. <laughs> I was gonna talk about, I was gonna talk about that and you stole it. Okay. So yeah, th I want us to understand that there's something really intrinsic here going on. God, God doesn't seem to need to rest. God's been enjoying this whole, it's been a lot of fun for God, but God chooses to rest. And I just want us to say that maybe there's something built into human beings. Maybe there's a missing puzzle piece that we just, when we maybe read Paul out of context and we, he says something about the Sabbath and we say, I think let's just chuck it away. And God's saying there's, 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 this, there's this puzzle piece of what it means to be a human where there's these ebbs and flows and there's these rhythms of life. And our world's saying, don't worry about rhythms. Don't worry about this kind of stuff. And God's like, I actually designed you this way. And we're like, no, no, don't worry about it. Uh, we got a better way to figure this out. And God's like, ah, this is how I built you to imitate something in me? What if there's a missing puzzle piece here that would change the way we think about life and the world has no idea what we're talking about here? Okay. <clears throat> I, wanna, I wanna just share something. Uh, the Bible is not written in a laboratory. Did you guys know that? It wasn't written in a laboratory as if these are like abstract ethics and then God's like, hey, I want to tell people how everything came about. 
um, <clears throat> Moses or Paul or whatever, just kind of get in my laboratory, we'll build this, and then we'll just send it down to the people in a time capsule. Do you guys know that? Oh, yeah, you guys know that. So the author and the original hearers, they have this larger surrounding context which the Bible is giving an alternative worldview to. Did you know that? So when we read the Bible, we have to realize that the Bible is always speaking against something. It's proclaiming something, but it's always speaking against something. Did you guys know that? And so when we, even when we read the Bible now in our society, we, we shouldn't assume <clears throat> when the Bible's talking about things that it's thinking our world's doing a good job. The Bible's always pushing up against our world. It's, it's subversive. I want to show you that in a second here. <clears throat> so what I want to do is I want to just show you the big story that was around during this time that Israel was opposing, Okay. So if you think about little Israel, little Israel is just this little, this little piece on the map, and they believe this story about God. But there's this bigger, bigger narrative, this bigger narrative that everybody seems to be believing in. Does that sound familiar? Our world's got this big narrative about what, the way things are working. It's got this big narrative about what's good and what's bad and what humans are. And then there's just this little church uh, and this Christianity that's saying, that's not right. So check this out. This is like common, this is, you can just go on the World History Encyclopedia if you want to check it out. This is the big story that the Bible's saying, uh-uh. No, there's a better picture here. Check this out. This is called the Atrahasis. And they, they found this, this is like an ancient mythology. This is like the big worldview, the big teaching of the day about what the world was like. Why do people exist? Why does God exist? Who are we? What's the purpose of life? This, 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 this is the world's version when Genesis was written, okay? This is a direct quote. When the gods instead of man did the work, bore the loads, the gods' load was too great, the work too hard, and the trouble too much. So th this is gonna talk about the creation of the world before there were human beings. And, and I, I just want us to, when we hear those words that the work was too hard for the gods, does that sound like the God that we see in Genesis 1? Does the God in Genesis 1, is he tired? Is he angry or frustrated? Does the God in our version, does he enjoy work? Yeah. Okay, check this out. This is a summary of the mythology. I need two hands and I don't have a, lapel mic anymore. The elder gods made the younger gods do all the work on the earth. Kind of like a elementary school bully system in recess. And after digging the beds for the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers, this mythology is coming from now modern day Iraq, NK, the god of wisdom, suggests that immortals create something new human beings, who do all the work instead of the gods. That's a great idea. And one of the gods, we Elihu, known as the God who has sense, offers himself as a sacrifice to this endeavor and is killed. And there's a different goddess, and her name is Nintu, and she adds flesh and blood and intelligence to clay and creates seven male and seven female human beings. Listen to this, this is super interesting. At first, the gods enjoy the leisure the human beings afford them, but in time, the people become too loud and disturb the gods' rest. Enlel, the, the, the king of the gods, the high god, is especially annoyed by the constant disturbance from below and so decides to lessen the population by sending first a drought, then pestilence, and then famine down upon the earth. After each of these plagues, the humans appeal to the God who first conceived them, Enke, the wisdom God, not the high God, this other loving God down below. And he tells them what to do to end their suffering and return the earth to a natural, productive state. Enlal, finally, that head God, finally can't stand no more and persuades the other gods to join him in sending a devastating flood to earth which will completely wipe out the human beings. 
And so this is the story that we are given. This is what the Israelites are fighting against. This is, this is their big worldview that people are telling. This is what life is really about. This is what it means to be a human. This is what the gods think of you. This is the purpose of humanity. So quickly, I just, we're just, I just want to compare it, okay? Based on what you guys have seen, here's the big worldview, okay? And over here, we're going to put Israel's worldview. What are the gods like? What kind of personalities do they have? What are their attributes? You guys can just shout it out or whatever. They're selfish, angry and lazy, mean, irritable, and they're, they're foolish, aren't they? And they're ungrateful. And then compare that to what we have here. There's this God. What is he like? Patient, loving. He enjoys us. He likes work. Grateful. He's a creator. He likes sharing the power and the glory, right? Like, I'm going to have dominion over the world. I want you to too. Do you guys see the difference here? And look at the difference between humans. Over here, humans are pawns. They're slaves. They have no value. The people, they, they enjoyed making them for a bit until they got too loud. Keep it down, down there. Keep it down. We're trying to eat grapes, right? And look at God over here. God, he creates us because he loves us. Do you guys see what's going on here? So Genesis is writing this, and we believe this is true, and this, this happened, but God is saying there's a different worldview going on here. And so when we come back to Genesis 2, verses 1 to 3, I just want us to hone in. Now that we know what the worldview is back then, I want us to hone in on this. It says God rested. And God doesn't need to rest. God doesn't get tired. God's enjoying this whole process. He's totally different than them. And I want us to notice that it says, and he blessed the seventh day and he made it holy. God, God's not doing this for himself as if God needs, God didn't need to create anything. Do you guys see, do you guys see what's going on here? He's trying to lead by example. Yeah, I, I want to I share something here. That's really good, Eric. God is grace. Okay, I, th I think sometimes we think when we read the, the Bible, the Old Testament, God was like, I'm going to really put these guys through the ringer and I'm just going to tire them out so much that when Jesus comes, they're going to be ready for me. And I want us to understand that, that God was under no obligation to create any of us. And God wasn't trying to get himself out of a pinch. There was no struggle to overcome. God is completely free. He created us and he created the world out of pleasure. Not out of any obligation, not out of any weakness. God did all of these things because he wanted to just enjoy the whole thing. And so I want to just share something here. This is from Karl Barth. Karl Barth was a theologian in the 1900s. Listen to this. Time of man begins on the basis of the work God has done before the human's time and not in any reference to any work still ahead of the human. Okay? So like what, this is what Brent's saying. Our first day on earth we get here and God has done all the work already. And he's like, guys, I love you. The time of man begins therefore with a day of rest and not a day of work, with freedom and not with obligation, with a holiday and not with a task, the joy and not with labor and toil, under the gospel and not under the law. And so what I want us to understand is that there's something built into us that God is trying to show us that we will be fulfilled and satisfied when we learn to recognize work is good and resting is good. And there's these rhythms and these patterns of life. God designs us this way like in verse, verses two and three because he's trying to show us something powerful. 
He's trying to help us to understand, to move into what is grace itself, that God knows you and he wants to give you himself. So God is under no obligation to set the world up the way he did, but he did it because he's trying to re reveal something of himself to us. I just want to share one more thing and then I want to open this up. On the left is how the world understands gifts. And it's also how the church sometimes understands gifts. And I want us to delete this from our thought pattern. Because God is a God of complete grace. But I want to share you with something here that's really important, okay? And this, this will continue to flow in the rest of our series. On the left, I think sometimes we think that it's, it's, it's as if when God wants to give us a gift, he goes into the forest and there's this little tree stump and he wraps up the present cute and he puts a little, uh, a little letter or a note that says I love you on it and then he runs back and he hides behind a tree. And we know where this tree stump is and, and he kind of watches around the corner and then we come into the forest and we skip and hop and we know where the gift will be and we pick up the gift and we look at it and we, we look into the forest and we can't see God but we kind of wave at him and say thank you and then we take the gift home and then we unwrap it and we enjoy the gift. And somehow we think that, that the gifts that God give us are detached from himself, that he can give us things without giving him without giving us himself. And I want to share that that's not ever how the Bible talks about things. God doesn't give gifts apart from himself and from his presence. Do you guys know that? So if we, if we look at life, all the things that God does in grace are attached to meeting him somehow. And the picture on the right is the more appropriate one. That when God gives a gift, what the gift actually is, it's an, it's an arena of grace. It's a, it's a place where heaven and earth touch. And when we receive a gift from God, it's a gift because he is present there. The gift itself is, is beautiful, but it's, 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 all it's doing is it's, it's creating a window or a door where we can walk through and be connected to him. And so I just want to challenge you that when we look at the Sabbath and its development, Jewish rabbis call the Sabbath eternity uttering a day. What the Sabbath means is that all of heaven and the eternalness of God is touching the finite earth. And when we, when we move into Sabbath, when we move into understanding what it is, this, this restfulness, we're meeting with God himself. We're meeting with eternity. We're, we're, even though we're looking back to the original Sabbath in Genesis, we're also looking to the future rest of God. And it's really weird because when you start practicing Sabbath patterns and different things in your life, uh, something happens like what Annette was talking about where we, 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 we meet with God and it's almost like we're, we enter into this other world. And it's just for a time and it's just like this little picture of eternity and it blows our mind and it, it reorients our whole world where we recognize that there's something bigger out there. And so as we, as we talk about what Sabbath is, maybe some of us are apprehensive of even the idea of Sabbath. We're going to go through the whole Bible and look at how Jesus and, and Paul and different things are going to unpack what it means. But I, I really want us to understand that this is crucial and it's integral. It's a missing piece in our world. Our world says there's no way that this can be true. The Jews were the first people to, to have this seven, seven week thing or seven day week thing going on where they took a day off. Everybody else was like, you're crazy. It's just as crazy then as it is now. We're going to look at that, and if you have to take a Saturday off, if you have to take a Sunday off, we'll look at all that kind of stuff later. But I, I, right now, I just want us to, to rest and really think about if we've been created this way, and if it reflects something about God, how is this going to change the rest of our life? What's the effect it'll have upon understanding these rhythms of grace? Okay? So I, I just, I want to leave it there and I want to end with uh, that psalm reading. 
Let's see if I can get to it. Psalm 92, I'm just, gonna, I'm just gonna read out of that and I want us to reorient our hearts and just give God the chance. Just give God the chance to speak into our lives if this Psalm or if this Sabbath thing has some merit. This is the end of Psalm 92. This guy has been living in the Sabbath. He's, he's blessing the Sabbath. He sees his power in his life and there's rhythms built into this Psalm itself in Psalm 92. And then he's looking at the benefit it has in his life. For surely your enemies, O Lord, surely your enemies will perish. All evildoers will be scattered. You've exalted my horn like that of a wild ox. Fine oils have been poured upon me. My eyes have seen the defeat of my adversaries. My ears have heard the root of my wicked foes. Now listen to this. The righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They will grow like a cedar of Lebanon. Planted in the house of the Lord, they will flourish in the courts of our God. In God's temple, we will be planted. They will still bear fruit in old age. They will still, they will stay fresh and green, proclaiming the Lord is upright. He is my rock. There's no wickedness in him. So the first question I want to, I have, I want to propose to us is, is if this is built into us, why did God choose to build this into us? This idea that we work six days and we take a day off or, or even just beyond that, the idea of rhythms and that, that there's this beauty and there's this order in our world. Why did he even choose to do that? And why has he created us that way? 